during regular business hours. This is Iowa Public Television. SCI Financial Group Incorporated, with offices in Cedar Rapids and Waterloo, is committed to the thorough discussion of today's current events and proud to help bring you the Iowa broadcast of the McLaughlin Group. the nation's capital, the McLaughlin Group, an unrehearsed program presenting inside opinions and forecasts on major issues of the day. GE is proud to support the McLaughlin Group. GE, from satellites to medical systems, we bring good things to life. Here's the moderator, John McLaughlin. Issue one, return of the magnificent seven, the G7 that is, the seven leaders of the industrial world, U.S., Japan, Germany, Great Britain, France, Canada, and Italy. The high U.S. unemployment rate will dominate President Bush's agenda at the summit of industrialized nations next week in Munich. What is President Bush's summit strategy? President Bush will try to play the summit as promoting U.S. economic interests. He'll say, jobs, 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 I'm going to come home, bring the bacon. Bringing home the bacon depends on the cooperation of allies who have economic problems of their own. Unemployment in Italy and Canada is 11%. France and Britain, 10%. So Bush must look to Germany and Japan. He needs to persuade German Chancellor Helmut Kohl to lower interest rates so Germans will spend more, hopefully on U.S. exports, which in turn will create jobs here. Will Kohl go along? Unlikely that Germany is going to take any steps that it doesn't perceive to be in its economic interest. As for Japan, Prime Minister Miyazawa has promised Mr. Bush that he would spur his economy through government spending and jawboning his corporate sector to buy more U.S. goods. But will Miyazawa keep his word? Yes. But how and when depends on the economic situation in my country. It's up to us to decide. So, will the Magnificent Seven cooperate in bailing out the U.S. economy and in the process help George Bush, I ask you, Freddie the Beetle Bond. John, not a chance. I don't know why you went through all that stuff. Uh, all the factors that are going to affect the American con economy between now and November 3rd, which is Election Day, you'll recall, uh, are already baked in the cake. What goes on over there can only help Bush in intangible ways. He can champion free trade. Uh, he can be, show some vigorous, inspirational leadership, which we haven't seen much of recently. Uh, he can talk about what he wants in his second term, but nothing that goes on there uh, is going to help him between now and November. And besides, as you pointed out, all those guys over there have domestic problems of their own. They could care less about helping George Bush. Right, I can tell our economy is in trouble just by looking at your clothes. Eleanor. <laughs> Uh, they're not going to bail out George Bush any more than they did Mikhail Gorbachev a year ago. And uh, that summit is going to be more about Sarajevo than about the world economy. That's what they're really going to talk about. And the Japanese and the Germans are prepared to make the most minor concessions. The, our, our trade deficit with Japan has gone up again. And I suppose the good news for George Bush is that nobody in this country is looking to the G7 to deliver economic salvation. Now, Jack, come on. By the way, welcome you, back, you, Jack. Uh, I'm sorry the decathlon was rigged. They, uh, they, <laughs> it's so lame. They, uh, Look, it's better uh, than I, I, you said I, about my suit. I, I see. I see you haven't. Um, I have, see you haven't lost your. Uh, I haven't reformed your, your preoccupation with meetings of middle-aged white men in blue suits talking about nothing. It's you mean you talk about I mean, this, the, the, G7? the G7 meeting? The, the the fact that this could have any. The, I mean, the possibilities could have any effect on our economy between now and Election Day is laughable. It just isn't going to happen. They're going to do things out of self-interest like they always do. And George Bush, the, the break for Bush is that most of the American people will pay no attention to that meeting. Do you think that Miyazawa means it, notwithstanding what, oh, what John says? Oh, come if, on. If Miyazawa pumps up his, primes his pump over there with public <laughs> spending and with uh, fiscal, fiscal uh, uh, measures, he could get a 3.5% John, growth John, for, in. John, forget it. The Japanese always promised. The second Japanese guy that you had said maybe, maybe, which is always the answer. Look, look, what George Bush has got to do is come back home 
and go to un an un unemployment office or go to a defense contractor and say, look, I know things are tough, but here's what we're doing and here's what we're trying to do and here's what we will do to try to get this economy right. But he won't. You don't he seem... You don't, seem to, you don't seem to realize that the G7 is an incumbent's club. They take care of each except, other, except and they're going to take care of George just Bush. A the way they would have to do it is to agree to a, 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 a settlement on GATT, the General Agreements on Tariffs and Trade, to make the Uruguay round a success. Will that, that happen? It will not happen. Oh, you're predicting failure for GATT, are you? I'm predicting... I'm do you know by the names <laughs> of the leaders of all of these industrial nations oh, that are God. there? <laughs> but what are their names? Do you know they're all their names? I'm not going to play this game. All right. You, let's what, let's what, assume you know the leader of Canada, and you know the leader of Great Britain and the, the United States, States and France, Mitterrand. Yeah. Who's the leader of Italy? The Prime Minister <laughs> of Italy. What's his name? Uh, I forget this week. Yeah. You see? <laughs> Giuliano <laughs> Amato Morton. Oh, all right. You got anything further to say on this? Otherwise, let's take a look at the economic baggage George Bush is taking with him. Let's take a look, look at it anyway. Let's take a look. <laughs> First, the good baggage. Leading indicators may up moderately. Industrial production up moderately. Personal income up slightly. Personal spending up moderately. Discount rate down big. Prime rate down big. Retail sales up slightly. Housing starts up big. First quarter, that is January, February, March, gross domestic product, GDP up almost big. 2.7%. Now, the bad baggage. New home sales down big. Purchasing managers index down big. Factory orders down big. Unemployment up big. Three-tenths of 1% now at 7.8%. On these unemployment statistics, both Bush and Clinton responded with their own spins. And my answer to the unemployment figures is, and it's would Please now, Congress, do what you should have done some time ago in terms of stimulating the economy. It's growing, but I want to see the growth more robust. The president has said that he'll do whatever it takes to get reelected and keep his job. But the best thing he could do is to help Americans keep their jobs and get more jobs. Instead of running one more negative campaign and blaming everybody else, all of us who want to be president, we should be out here offering our plans to get this economy going again. So, Mort, is Rosie, that is Rosie's scenario, is Rosie back with us? Rosie, Rosie is not back. I mean, a 7.8% unemployment rate is serious, and it's serious politics for Bush. It's terrible politics for Bush. Now, conceivably, the July numbers will be better because in June, uh, high school and college graduates go into the labor market and so on, and, uh, and so there might be a slight improvement. But this is not good stuff for Bush, and there's a certain poetic justice to all this. I mean... George Bush uh, presided over the wretched excess of the 1980s along with Ronald Reagan. Now the hangover is coming that, that is uh, happening on his watch. The next president presumably will have a much better economy uh, to deal with, well, regardless of what his policy is. Well, 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 it's Ronald well, Reagan's fault. Yeah, did, you pick, did you pick that up? <laughs> well, if he hadn't said it, Eleanor would have. But no, I'm waiting for <laughs> a chance. <laughs> well, Jack, Jack is back with us. Yeah, yeah. Jack could have. Anybody could. You might have, John. Look. Uh, George Bush's problem is this. He made his mistake late last year when he didn't decide to fight for his growth agenda, for a cut in the capital gains, tax cut, and so on. Now, when he says, uh, gee, why didn't Congress pass my, uh, my economic growth measure, uh, nobody takes that seriously because he didn't fight for him. It's not that he doesn't have these growth measures yeah. that would have helped. It's that he hadn't fought that, for them. That wasn't Jack, that's, that's not... Uh, you know what the killer is here? You see, the, the, the people see the number, the unemployment number jump like that. Three-tenths of a point a month is big. They see that, and what that confirms is a feeling already of 70, 70 to 75 percent, even 80 in some polls, that the country is headed in the wrong direction. That is murder for incumbents. And he, to turn that around between now and November is going to be very difficult. Right. Do you deny that there are some positive statistics there? You don't deny that, no, do you? They are, but they are much overshadowed. Yeah, we have, yeah, we have 10 million people out of work. This is true. They are overpowered people. by the unemployment statistics. Right. And the sad news is that this is a productivity uh, uh, recovery right. rather than it is a jobs recovery. People are downsizing their firms, but, but their profit productivity. Well, up. So that's politically well, bad for Bush. Is we're choking on the deficit and George Bush in many ways is a victim too of the Reagan legacy and his own passivity I mean he may have a program up there but it was a lackluster program that he only did because he thought he had to do something and he never fought for it and if he and so does people, now looks like a deathbed conversion you know? Freddie right. can you say that there's any good news for Bush in this in political news in that the people who are affected by this uh, joblessness are uh, in the younger age bracket and they're no, less inclined to vote and they're less inclined to, you generally speaking 
Wait, wait, wait a minute. That's you missed the, that's the you problem miss here. They, they, the people who have been unemployed here are middle managers. They are, they are suburbanites. And what's no, happening? I, I, what's no. happening is, no. is that the, is that the corporate corporations yet. you were getting ready to <laughs> corporations, <laughs> corporations sh are choking on debt. They're paying off debt oh, okay. by by laying off John, middle managers. I've heard all that baloney. I want to know why John is straining so hard to find the silver lining here for George Bush. I yes. say that there are positive economic there are. statistics. There are, John, but, but they're overpowered, as Jack says, by, by these joblessness right. statistics. Where you but I'm also saying that recent high school and college graduates are the ones that are the more affected, and they don't vote. That, so maybe politically it's not quite that you're bad. But they're but they're you're misunderstanding. Wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. He's calling on me, Alan. Just hold it for a minute. The Why misunderstanding of Mort, so the misunderstanding of Mort and John, your misunderstanding is that people don't vote their own pocketbook. You know what they vote on? They vote on where they think the economy is going. When they see a seven-point un unemployment statistic, they think the economy is going bad. No right. way can this help Bush. These kids who are unemployed have mo mothers and fathers, and they know how bad it is out there. And, people and look... So this is no. not a secret that is only kept by the 20-something crowd. Let's exit. The exit question is as follows. Let's, let's assume that the economy in November is giving the mixed signals that it's giving now. At best, mixed signals. Let's assume also that this is a pocketbook election, as it unquestionably is. Who stands to gain more from the condition of the economy, as I have just described it? Perot, Clinton, or Bush? I ask you. The guy that all the polls show that people have the most faith in, a guy who can turn around the economy. That's Ross Perot. What do you think? Oh, Bill Clinton is the only one with a, with a realistic plan. What do you think, Jack? I think Clinton, not any Democrat does. I mean, the, the, um, there are a lot of people who still say Republicans mean the hard Clinton over Perot? You know. On these other yeah, economies, yeah. what do you think? I mean, it all depends on how, how, whether Perot comes up with a program or not. If he comes up with a program, then he benefits. The answer is Perot. Issue 2, Abortion Battle Line. The Supreme Court this week handed down its decision on a Pennsylvania law on abortion. The High Court had to decide whether the law was compatible with the Constitution. Here are the provisions of that Pennsylvania statute. One, the woman must wait 24 hours. Two, minors must have parental consent. Three, alternatives to abortion must be reviewed by a doctor with the woman. Four, husbands must be notified by their wives before the abortion is done. The Supreme Court upheld provisions 1, 2, and 3 of Pennsylvania's law this week in a 5-4 to four decision, but the court struck down the spousal notification provision. As a result of this ruling, states are given substantial power to restrict abortion. But the five justices of the majority, O'Connor, Kennedy, Souter, Stevens, and Blackman, all want to keep Roe v. Wade, the 1973 Supreme Court ruling, which legalized abortion. A woman's right to terminate her pregnancy before viability is the most central principle of Roe v. Wade. It is a rule of law and a component of liberty we cannot renounce. So said the five members of the majority. The four members of the minority, Chief Justice Rehnquist, Scalia, White, and Thomas, think the opposite. Speaking for the minority, Rehnquist said, quote, We believe that Roe was wrongly decided and that it can and should be overruled. Both sides of the abortion debate were unhappy with the ruling, however, and they expressed themselves with great vigor. This decision today is appalling, and Kennedy and Souter and O'Connor should be ashamed of their cowardice and their betrayal of the children and of justice. Today, the Supreme Court took another giant step backward, uh, setting back the cause of women's rights and setting back the lives and health of women. Did the Supreme Court do the right thing, Fred? And what's the impact of this ruling on the three presidential contenders, Bush, Clinton, and Perot? Give me those names again, who they are. <laughs> Look, uh, I think the court uh, did exactly the wrong thing. This was an incredibly arrogant decision where they upheld Roe v. Wade and, and these mild restrictions because they thought that's where the most of uh, the American people are, that they believe in that. This was entirely political. And oh, okay. then, this and then, an and then, they, wait a minute, Eleanor, and then in the decision, in the plurality decision, they have the arrogance to tell the American people, look, we've resolved this issue, and you better quit complaining about it. Stop bickering. That this, was incredibly arrogant. The court arrogant. did the best with the people they have on the court, and Sandra Day O'Connor is a heroine here in trying to find a middle ground and salvage what is left of Roe. The problem is that it does not resolve the issue. It is now in the political arena, and both sides, the pro-choice and the pro-life, are going to work to get the one more justice that will turn this decision around. And so abortion becomes 
a centerpiece in virtually every race in this country. On the presidential level, it gives an edge to the two candidates who are pro-choice. Yeah, you've, you've got, you've got a, um, it, it is not much to say you're, you're, you're sa uh, saving, salvaging Roe if you proceed to gut it at the same time. The fact is, the problem here is that you're allowing government, a bunch of, of legislators, to decide whether women have control over this decision or not and to put limits on it. Now, the, the, the standard they set in this decision, undue burden, has to be defined by subsequent cases. But nonetheless, it is the government telling women what they're going to do, whether they can have an abortion or not. And, that, and the basic problem is, that is, is why, why the decision is wrong, and it is wrong to see the decision as a victory for choice, because it isn't. <laughs> it is neither is a victory for the pro-life people. You're saying government. Uh, you mean, you mean, I mean government, period. I mean, mean state Congress, government. too. I mean state government, Congress. Politically, it is, it, is a, it is an important decision because it ice the five to four thing, shows people finally, which was not clear in, in 1988, that one justice does make a great deal of difference here. So that's going to be an issue look, that we, be Look, we, we live in a democracy. Everything gets decided politically. This issue is going to be decided politically by, by one means or another. It's going to be decided this election. politically okay. by throwing the damn well, ball. Yeah, right, but so, so just a second. It's going to get decided politically. I it's think, frankly, oh, yes, of course Let it is. Let him finish. It's going to get decided by who gets elected uh, president and who uh, appoints the, the next justice. It's going to get decided at the state level by what laws get established. It was decided politically in Pennsylvania. I think, frankly, that this benefits of the three presidential candidates, Ross Perot, who has a position most like the Pennsylvania law, which is to say abortions ought to be allowed but under certain circumstances, whereas George Bush is a sellout to the, to the pro-life maximalists, and, and Bill Clinton is a pro-choice maximum. Yeah, but it's oh, no yeah. longer, this is no hey, longer a, a presidential issue in this it, campaign. It, it is no longer is. No, no, it's no, practically it neutralized. No, it's it's practically neutralized. What do you say It's not going to be decided, decided politically. What the court did by setting this vague undue burden standard uh, was to say you're going to have to send up every little regulation that it involves abortion from now until doomsday Fred, is going to be decided right, on Eleanor. First, first of all, the political Bill process. Clinton is not a pro-choice maximalist, whatever that is. He did sign a parental notification law, which on puts this, him in the mainstream on, on this, this issue. Issue. And, and where this issue will be decided is the incoming Congress where we're going to have more minorities, more women. You elect 15 women to the House of Representatives. You've got the override right there. Well, Congress me, will pass let, a let Freedom a of Choice here. Act, which George Bush will veto in uh, September, uh, and the issue will be right out there for the public to decide. My question to you is, I think this is a plus for Bush, because he still has the pro-life forces behind him, and right. the Supreme Court will let him off the, to the hook so he doesn't have to face well, the consequences. It, it, this is a dead issue it, for all practical it, no, purposes it, it, well, in the presidential election. No. It's not, it's, it's, I think... It's, 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 go ahead. It's not a dead issue, John, because they're going to argue, they're going to talk about the appointing the so-called swing justice, if so. It's not a dead issue because the women candidates, on whom there are many, running for the Senate can say to, to voters in their states, it makes a difference who's there to vote confirmation. And look at Clarence Thomas's vote to wow. prove that. That's, it is not a dead issue. That's, that's not going to be a big issue in these races. The fact is, Bush is the only pro-life candidate running. He's running against two pro-choice people. People who vote just on the abortion issue, the choice people are going to divide between a pro and Clinton, and Bush is what going to I'm get the pro-life. I don't help. see how uh, uh, Perot has helped here. Because Perot has not really spoken. He says this issue is a no, minefield. No, no, no. We, need, we need to bring in a, a panel of the experts. The prize in this election in the fall are Republican suburban women. And uh, if Bush loses the, them, he loses a big portion of his support, and they, they could very well go to Ross Perot as a nice way to We're going to get out. We're going to get out. We're going to get out. What's the exit? polling data support What's that? the answer to this exit question? Which one of the presidential candidates gazed the most from this decision, do you think? Uh, probably Perot. Perot. Mm -hmm. Although I think overall, excluding this decision, Bush, the, the abortion issue will help Bush in this election. He thinks it's a woman's choice, but he's mum on what kind of limits the government should put on it, if any. But what do you say? Um, Bill Clinton, because there's emotional immediacy to the argument that the Supreme Court matters and a pro-choice president matters. What do you think, Jack? I agree with him. What do you think? Uh, Bush is going to have all the right to lifers to himself, but, but and uh, Clinton will have the pro-choicers, and all of those millions and millions of people who are in the middle somewhere are going are to incline themselves toward parole. I think the biggest winner is uh, Bush for reasons stated. Issue 3, political potpourri item, Clinton beefsteak. This weekend, Bill Clinton will select his running mate, but will delay his announcement until closer to the convention. Here's Clinton's short list.
Tennessee Senator Al Gore, Indiana Congressman Lee Hamilton, Nebraska Senator Bob Kerry, Pennsylvania Senator Harris Wofford. Question, what are the minuses and pluses of these contenders, Jack Jamon? Well, the, the um, first of all, I'm not sure that's the list. That there are other names that may be on and some of like, those may not like. be on. Like Bob Graham of Florida, well, maybe some of these are on here. Well, I'm talking about short list. Is, is he on the short list? He's on the medium list. <laughs> Who knows? Still in contention. Nobody I mean, knows uh, what the real list is. Well, right. you, you, have all, you have all kind of lists. There was, there was nobody on there except Walford who would bring you a big state's electoral vote. He, he could bring you Pennsylvania's electoral vote, presumably. So, yeah, so the others are. He's got a problem. A, though. What's his problem? The, the problem is abortion because he's he supported the Pennsylvania law. Of the others, Hamilton is is the is the safest choice in the sense that he is. Got a foreign policy credential. He's a solid citizen. His reputation for being intelligent, for being honest, and so forth. What's his the, minus? Uh, the, uh, no his, state. His minus is that he's not very scintillating. But uh, and, the, and he doesn't bring any state. state. And he doesn't. He's a small state. Gore, the Gore state is the same size essentially. Not scintillating. And, and I don't, I don't, see, of the year. I don't see why you want to put uh, why he would want to put I mean, the Gore thing doesn't make any sense to me because it's, it's enough state abutting his own. If he can't win Tennessee without Gore. He can't win. Yeah, okay, he doesn't have the state, know. but he's a, he's, a, he's a great campaigner. His it's, wife's a great campaigner. Oh, his, he's wife, been, he's been, he's, his wife, Tipper, is dynamite in, in California, particularly in the, in the music industry. And can't you imagine, can't you imagine Tipper and Hillary uh, having, uh, having tea and, 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 and cookies together? But, uh, but I want to stay on this Gore thing. Uh, don't you think Gore is support of the Persian Gulf War? He's very good on foreign policy. He's very good on national security. Gore, he's very good on the environment. Gore is a very able guy in many respects, but what is the point of having two southern moderate candidates on the ticket. Yeah, well, I think you try in a, th th a three-way race, geography is not as important, and I think Gore and uh, Clinton would be the all-generational change ticket, and I suppose if they could lose, they could do cameo appearances on studs no. or something, no. but uh, I, I, I think that what Clinton is looking at is competing concerns here, either, you know, two yuppies, or does he go for a little age and gravitas? I think Lee Hamilton brings the brush cut Haircut and a little sense of the 50s, which maybe he could use. Give me 10 seconds. We've got to move. Look, Al Gore was in favor of the Gulf War. Lee Hamilton and Bob Carey were not. Right? Uh, I just said that. Uh, just a second. Al Gore. Uh, uh, Al, Gore. Al Gore served in Vietnam, which uh, which Clinton did not. Uh, Bob and Carey I think did that too. G what? Bob Carey Bob Bob Carey did too, but Bob Carey, Bob Carey is associated seconds. with Deborah Winger, yeah. for heaven's sakes, which raises well, all kinds of things. Nothing wrong with Deborah Winger, as far as I can tell. You know, if you're looking for a character. Did you see that story about the space alien meeting with Perot? You know, you look a little bit like that space alien. Let's get out. You do, the question is, who's he going to pick? we well, got one way to answer. we got to move real fast. Fred. Ought to be Sam Nunn. will probably be Lee Hamilton. Lee Hamilton. Uh, Hamilton or Gore, I can't make up you my mind, and I mind? hope Bill Clinton can. <laughs> okay. What, do you, what about yourself? Would you take it if he offered it to you, Eleanor? <laughs> uh, I get along fine with Hillary. <laughs> How about with Bill? Everyone does. What do you think, Jack? He ought to pick Nancy Pelosi of California, but he would pick Hamilton. He'll pick Hamilton? Al Gore. The answer is Al Gore. Issue four, Burning Bush. I'm getting a lit, little sick and tired of being on the receiving line, receiving end of criticism day in and day out from all those sorry Democrats that were running for president and now some independents. President Bush came out swinging early this week. That target was his political opposition. This one is the press. I'm just getting warmed up on you guys, I'll tell you. Because I've only mentioned about four issues here that where I think we are just exactly where the heartbeat of America is. But you couldn't tell it because of all the noise and the fury out there of Politics 92, endless polls, weird talk shows, crazy groups every Sunday telling you what you think. But on Wednesday, Mr. Bush did a 180. The president popped up on a talk show, presumably not a weird one, CBS This Morning. Mr. Bush spent 90 minutes in the White House Rose Garden chatting with the two hosts and fielding 17 questions from among 125 Americans representing 26 states. These Americans wanted to know about the economy, urban policy, foreign events, and education. Surprisingly, in light of his Monday attacks, Mr. Bush seemed remarkably placid on Wednesday, turning down every opportunity to criticize anyone. I think we're in a strange election year, and I've decided, and you'll try to get me to do this, I've decided not to attack uh, any of the opponents. All right. What's going on here? Why these mixed signals? 
I ask you, Morton. Uh, I don't know. Maybe it's a, a weird uh, side effect of Graves' disease or something. You bounce up and then you bounce down. And crazy group. <laughs> yes, I know. Like this one. This is a weird talk show, John. We've known it for no, a long time. No, this is time. a crazy group. <laughs> All right, let's go. What, is that all you well, have to say? No, I, I mean, I think that, yeah, this is a weird talk show. Uh, no, we what I think, that down, I think, I think that, uh, that these are two sides of George Bush, that on the one hand, he is enraged that the press uh, never quite lets it through what his, uh, his wonderful economic growth package is, uh, and at the same time, he, on, when he goes on one of these nice talk shows, he wants to be to be seen as a statesman. So I, I think it's what is this all about? about? I ask the you. The American people think, though, when they watch Bush on television, saying, "I'm not in the campaign mode," and actually he's sitting out there being interviewed only because he is in the campaign mode. If he weren't in a, if he weren't campaigning, he wouldn't have uh, had CBS come into the Rose Garden in the first place. The problem with Bush when he goes on these shows is he has nothing to say. If he had something to say, well, he probably wouldn't have to go on anyway. He could yep. say it in speeches. Right. Well, the, the lurching style reflects the conflict within his campaign. They don't know whether they should go into the attack mode or the Rose Garden mode, whether he should be optimistic or realistic. If he's optimistic, he looks out of touch. If he's realistic, it's depressing to listen to him. He doesn't know it's what to take. It, it, it's another, I mean, the real problem with the, with the president is he has let other people setting the, set the agenda for the campaign. Ross Perot started with the talk show stuff. The networks make the time available to everybody. Now, he said he wouldn't do that. It was beneath the dignity of the White House and so forth. And he ends up doing it. The problem... The, the issues are all being dictated by people other than the president. He's on the defensive... Bill Clinton is going to be hurt badly on the abortion issue by one, adopting a litmus test saying he'd only appoint Roe v. Wade advocates as, uh, as judges. He said he'd screen out all others. And screen out everybody. And secondly, by adopting now what is essentially an abortion on demand position, which is unpopular in the country. Eleanor. Uh, first of all, he hasn't adopted abortion on demand, which is a buzzword, and Fred knows that. And uh, second, his position on and what he has said about the Supreme Court would help him. Uh, my real prediction, the convention, Barbara Jordan, last of the keynote speakers, because she's so good, nobody wants to follow her. What do you think, Jack? The, um, I think, just I think, given I us think, the I program think, of the convention. I think, <laughs> I think Perot is, is uh, taking enough to hit, particularly among women in the, in the tracking now, that after the Democratic convention, next national polls, he'll be third. Serbian forces will begin shelling uh, uh, Sarajevo again, and United States jets will have to attack, possibly during the G7 summit next week. Political comeback of the year, Packwood over O'Coin in Oregon for the U.S. Senate seat. Bye-bye. The McLaughlin Group. GE is proud to support the McLaughlin Group. GE. From satellites to medical systems, we bring good things to life. For a transcript, send $5 to Federal News Service, 620 National Press Building, Washington, D.C., 20045. Specify program date. To obtain a free McLaughlin Group Viewer's Guide, write Viewer's Guide, Box 786, Madison Square Station, New York, New York, 10159. Topics are selected by Mr. McLaughlin, and the opinions expressed are solely those of the participants. SCI Financial Group Incorporated, with offices in Cedar Rapids and Waterloo, is committed to the thorough discussion of today's current events and proud to help bring you the Iowa broadcast of the McLaughlin Group. For the first time, McNeil, PBS, and NBC, Brokaw, join forces, Lehrer, for continuous primetime convention coverage, expert reporting, combined analysis of the parties, candidates, and the issues. Beginning Monday, July 13th on Iowa Public Television. Hey, this is our world. We're going to be running it tomorrow. What's on the minds of young people this election year? A lot of you, the politicians don't care about young people's issues. It just shows me, you know, how much, how much the political system has messed, messed up our country. I believe there's a lot of positive energy coming from youth today if they're allowed the chance. The Youth Vote, next on Listening to America. Tune into Iowa Public Television Tuesday evening at 9.
This week on Living in Iowa, find out what hand-to-mouth means. I'm Morgan Halgren, and on this week's show, El Cater's Girl Scouts show us their views of world hunger. A food co-op in Iowa City serves the tastes of the organically correct, and a radio broadcast from a bookstore allows authors to vocalize their written words. Watch Living in Iowa, always something a little different, tonight at 7.30.